Matt Miller is the founder of Medical Device Investments. Today, he will be speaking about the seven golden rules for entrepreneurial success. Good morning. Good morning. So, my grandfather was sold as a seven-year-old in um, rural Tennessee. His mother, my great-grandmother had died of polio. My great-grandfather didn't know what he was going to do with a seven-year-old. And there was a gentleman who used to drive cattle from Virginia and North Carolina to Texas, back and forth. So my great-grandfather got the great idea, I'll just sell the kid. And he did. And my grandfather, from the time he was seven, seven years old to the time he was 11 years old, drove cattle and would clean saddles, clean girths, and um, make meals, wash dishes, and do the cattle drives. That was a great man who, who bought him. Luckily, he was very nice. And um, he then retired when my grandfather was about 11 years old, and he then passed him off to a traveling circus. So my grandfather would then clean the animals' cages and help out with the circus, and then in each city that he would go to, he would go to the library, and he would ask the um, librarians if they would teach him how to read, and if they would teach him numbers. So um, not a lot of librarians between in Texarkana and Arkansas and Mississippi and Texas really knew a lot about numbers, but they certainly taught him how to read. So he did the uh, circus, traveling circus, until he was about 15, and uh, then that kind of ended, and he was taken in by an orphanage, in Fort Worth, Texas, and across the street from the orphanage was a um, GM plant that made fr frigid air products. And uh, in the orphanage, he wasn't doing much, and wasn't going to school, so they sent him across the street to see if he couldn't get a job doing anything in the GM plant. So he ended up getting a job as a runner in the plant. He would bring tools from the tool uh, shed or the tool area to the machinists on the floor who would fix the machines and he would bring them back. And the gentleman in the tool shed said, if you can learn numbers, I will actually help you um, get some other jobs in, um, in the factory. So then he went back to the librarians in Fort Worth, Texas, and somebody taught him numbers. And he then was able to work for, uh, as an assistant to the um, plant accountant. Long story short, my grandfather worked his way up to be the controller of General Motors and worked directly for W.C. Durant, went on to be president of the Frigid Air Division that made frigida uh, refrigerators and ovens and, and the like. And he was actually the first person who ever had the idea to paint a refrigerator something other than white. And so we have colored refrigerators, or had colored refrigerators, now everything's stainless steel. Um, primarily because of him and a, um, um, an African-American pastor in Oakland, California, who wanted to raffle off a golden-colored refrigerator. And he called up Detroit and said, can you paint, you can paint cars any color, can you paint a refrigerator gold? And they said, absolutely, and we'll paint them red and yellow and green and seafoam, and we're going to send you out a train full of those refrigerators, just don't send them back. I'm telling you this because my grandfather was an entrepreneur. Now, on my mom's side, we're Croatian. You have never seen more cost-conscious, conservative-with-money people than five-foot-tall Croatian women. My mother still has her seventh-grade lunch money. <laughs> Seriously, she still has it in a bag. Um, so I was grown up in a family that had a grandfather who was self-made, and a grandmother who came over from Croatia, my, my great-grandmother came over from Croatia. My grandmother was in the Boston Bloomer Girls, was in vaudeville, built a resort in Wisconsin with her own two hands, wore jeans before women wore jeans at all, and raised by, uh, they all got divorced, by the way, because they thought their husbands held them back. So each generation of women in my mom's family was raised by their grandmother because their mothers were out working. My grandmother became a bank manager and a bank president in Kansas City, Missouri. My great-grandmother had a string of hair salons and laundromats. Funny story, a guy once broke in, this was during the Depression, broke into her apartment and was going to rob her at gunpoint 
And my, at that time, my great-grandmother didn't believe in banks very much, so she kept money all over the house. And she said, um, okay, you can, and he didn't know how much money she had. She gave him a, a tin can full of money. And as he was leaving, she said, two things are going to happen. One, I'm going to shoot you in the back with my shotgun. Or two, I'm going to call the police, you're going to get arrested, and you're going to go to jail. I have a pretty good idea why you need the money. It's the depression. You're out of work. Is that correct? That's correct. Why don't you have a seat here and take off that stupid mask you're wearing? He sat down and took off his mask. What's your situation? Well, I have a wife and two kids, and I can't feed them, and I'm going to use this money to go to the grocery store and buy food. She said, I have a string of laundry mats. You meet me here tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock in the morning. And he became a manager for her and would go around to all the laundry mats and collect money. And he actually ended up working for her for about 15 years. So that's my, my background. I have people in my family who are very forward-thinking, very active, and don't let anybody hold them back. And those are kind of the, the necessary ingredients you need to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs, the word entrepreneur and the being an entrepreneur has some good connotations and some bad connotations. People don't set out to be entrepreneurs, I don't think. And certainly high schools don't teach people to be entrepreneurs. Colleges don't. Um, you can take a smattering of entrepreneur classes in most MBA programs, but they're really not going to prepare you to be an entrepreneur. They're going to prepare you to understand the vocabulary that is used. But um, did you know that only five MBA programs in the country have an emphasis in sales at all? That's pretty incredible since business pretty much relies on sales, last time I checked. So when I was uh, growing up, my father being a physician, an orthopedic surgeon. He was the first orthopedic surgeon who had an engineering degree when he applied to medical school. My mother, being Croatian, said, I'll marry you, but I want you to be a doctor. He was graduating from Purdue with, civil, uh, with mechanical engineering. And she said, why don't you look at medical school? So he went to medical school. Um, he wanted to marry her, those Croatian women. And, um, and when he applied to medical school at the University of Cincinnati, they had to convene a committee to decide whether an engineer had the aptitude to make it through medical school. So they said, you know what, let's give him a try. But he was one of the, ended up being one of the founders of uh, the study of biomechanics and, and biomechanical research. He did the first cemented total hip in the United States, um, which is another funny story. Uh, but I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to kind of get going here. But my father looked at his job and his field in orthopedics from, from a very entrepreneurial point of view. And I was able to participate and go in to see grand rounds with him and go into surgeries with him when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. I was very familiar with the medical community. I was very familiar with medical instrumentation. And I was always very into making money. All of my brothers and sisters, they're very science-oriented people. When Growing up in Cincinnati, when we would have a snow day, my sister would feel bad that she doesn't get to go into school and take the test that she studied for. My brother would go down into the basement and get out his chem set and play with his chemistry set. I would go out and plow everybody's driveway in the neighborhood and come home with $400, which then my artistic brother, he was the middle one, would take from me. I was the youngest. So I would go to work a lot with my dad, and I knew more about total hip surgery by the time I was 16 than most residents did. I could do a total hip surgery. So I went into a business, into a field that I was very comfortable with. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you want to go into a field that you're very comfortable with. That could be medicine, that could be biotech, it could be software, it could be computers, it could be real estate, it doesn't matter, but you better know it, and you better know it well. Um, so that's not one of my rules today. That's sort of a foundation that no matter what you go into, you have to be an expert in it. And I sort of like how D Donald Trump when he's talking about what are, what's your Middle East policy going to be, he said, well, if I become president, I'm going to know more about the Middle East than you and all the media and everybody else combined, because that's how an entrepreneur thinks. And he's like, he believes that. Whether that's true, he actually does believe that. And I believe when I go and start a company and I'm raising money and I'm asking people to come work for me, I better know what I'm talking about. So that's sort of a foundation. So I start companies. I went to work for Biomed, as I said, I started in sales, and I was selling hips and knees in Southern California, and calling on doctors and going to surgeries and, and hospital uh, physician lounges before they're in surgery and trying to sell them on the McKee for our knee and the McKee for our hip. And I moved inside to Biomed, and I worked my way up inside Biomed in their marketing department to, 
to, uh, in, in their hip group. And then um, serendipitously, when I went to an, uh, an Academy of Orthopedic Surgery convention, I met a gentleman who was working for a German biotech company, and they were actually regenerating autologous cartilage for reimplantation in the knee. And I thought that was interesting. Since the beginning of man, when we have a problem in the human body, we cut it off, cut it out, and replace it with a fake one. That's our MO. That's all we know, and we still do it today. It's pretty draconian, if you think about it. Now, we know a lot about the molecules of cells, and we know a lot about genomics, and I'm actually starting a genomics company presently, so I'm going to wind some of that into this talk. But our MO is pretty crude still. Cut it off, cut it out. Your hip hurts, you have hip arthritis, let's cut out your hip and stick a ball and socket in there. Your knee hurts, let's cut out your knee and put a fake one in. That's our MO. I thought when I heard about codon regenerating, we take a little, they take a little bit of cartilage out of your knee. I didn't even know really what the phenotype of the cell of cartilage was. I just knew it was something that was damaged and we usually cut it out in my business. We cut it out and place it with titanium. These people are regenerating it? What's that? So they would take the this, this cells out and put them in a Petri dish, put it in their bioreactor, regenerate them on an order of magnitude, and then put them back in the body with the hopes of repaving your arthritic knee, thereby not having the necessity of cutting it out and replacing it with a fake one. I thought that was pretty novel. So I talked to Dane Miller, the CEO of Biomet, and I said, I've done the big company thing for a while. This company would like to have somebody in business. It was started by two biochemists from the Max Planck Institute. They needed a businessman. I would like to try my hand at running a small company. And I'd always had an entrepreneurial bent to myself, so I went to work for them. And we went, the first thing we did was go public under Deutsche Bank. It was my first IPO. And I absolutely fell in love with it. I fell in love with the financing. I fell in love with the roadshow presentations. I fell in love with taking what these two brilliant scientists had in their head and were incapable of conveying to an audience, doing it for them. And the company was very successful. We ended up actually taking it public and then selling, uh, selling off the parts of it. And during one of those um, activities, I, I was raising money in, uh, on Wall Street for the company for a cardiac division. And I met my, the gentleman who would become my mentor and who would teach me the seven goal, golden rules for being an entrepreneur. Seven golden rules that are so important, I have them laminated and I take them with me everywhere I go. Um, Steve Gorlin was listening to my presentation for Codon and afterwards, my two CEOs were there, afterwards he came up to me and said, I'm not going to invest in a German company. They have a death spiral with their financing. Uh, you don't even know what that is, but I'll tell you about it later. But I would like to hire you today. And I said, what am I going to do for you? And he said, I have the faintest idea, but I'm going to find something for you to do because people make the difference. Accomplished people. Get the most accomplished people you can involved in your company. Accomplished people is the first rule. You bet on the jockey, not the horse. The horse will either cross the finish line or it won't. It's the jockey who rides it there. Rule two, high barriers to entry. We, in our industry, you can be an entrepreneur and be in real estate. You can be an entrepreneur and develop golf clubs. In our industry, we like to have things that we can protect, like strong patents, keeps, keeps competitors out. We like, the, we like the FDA regulatory pathway because it keeps competitors out. I don't want all of you to go home and start to compete with me in the medical world because it's so easy. So we pick things that have high barriers to entry, FDA approval process, strength, uh, strong patents, and whatever business you get in, get in something that you can protect. That you know it, you know it better. That, that could be just know-how, that could be intellectual property, that could be patents, that could be uh, you know, a lot of different things. In our industry, it's patents and regulatory approval. Um, we choose products with long product life cycles in large um, markets. So we like to be on the upslope of an industry. For example, we're doing this genomics company now. Genomics is kind of new. It's been, you know, we mapped uh, the human genome starting in, two, in, 1990, in 1988 and finished it in 2003. Um, it used to be that, that to get a human genome mapped cost about $100,000. Two years later, it was costing $10,000. Two years later, it was down to $1,000. And probably in two years, it'll be about $500. And most of your children and probably most of you will have your genome mapped at some time or another. Um, so there's a long product life cycle in, in that business. 
um, you want sustainable competitive advantages. Um, and you want to be able to grow a business over a long period of time and not have the business and the life cycle run out before you can get the company going. You want to, we like to, and you want to choose a product that has large profit margins. Large profit margins help dampen the impact of the inevitable errors that all managers make. High societal impact. We like medical uh, products because they do have high societal impacts. And the investment community places a premium on uh, that, that technology. Um, you want to skim the cream on technologies before other people know, their cream, know it's cream. So choose products that uh, are ahead of their time. Don't be scared of products that uh, you may think are science fiction. They're probably not. And uh, the Brody rule, uh, Bill Brody was president of Johns Hopkins University. He gave me this one. He said, if the vision is not immediately obvious, if it's very difficult to explain a technology, if you can't explain it in the elevator between floors, it's probably going to be very difficult to get off the ground. The easier it is to explain, the easier and more likely that business is going to be successful. So there are my golden rules, and uh, thank you. Thank you.